Cotney Attorneys and Consultants is dedicated to helping the construction industry with legal, business, and safety challenges. Welcome to this week's episode of Law and Mortar with John Kenny and Trent Cotney. Hey, it's Trent Cotney, CEO of Cotney Attorneys and Consultants, and I want to welcome everybody to another episode of Law and Mortar. As always, I've got John Kenny. John, how are you doing today? Doing great. Glad to be here. Hope everybody's having a great week and a fantastic weekend coming up. Yep, absolutely. John, we've got a lot to talk about. And I know, you know, in your capacity as CEO of our consulting group, you know, you've been working a lot with the estimating training. Um, Little shout out, you know, I I know that we're real close to getting the Spanish version of that training out. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so first one coming out is going to be our intermediate training, and that is already completely uh, translated into Spanish. Uh, Work get all the little kinks were already worked out. The test has been translated over. So I think we're ready to launch that out here probably next week. And we have the advanced model uh, program going into translation right now. So probably by the end of this coming, or it actually be next month, by the end of August, we'll have that one up and running as well. So a lot of progress, exciting things coming. That's exciting, you know, and I've I've been talking to um, a lot of our friends that are very interested in getting this for, you know, themselves and their crew. Um, I think being able to offer this training in languages and other than English is going to be, you know, critical and help expanding the training that's out there. So there really isn't a lot. First off, there's almost no estimating training out there other than than the work that you've been doing. Uh, But in addition to that, you know, regardless of what the training is, there's almost no Spanish training available. So um, I think this is definitely a, a move in the right direction. I know we'll be working on more. Um, this last week, we were at FRSA, uh, the, the 99th uh, trade show and expo, and a uh, huge turnout. I was really impressed with the amount of people that we had uh, attend our seminars. Um, I did one on contracts, but I also touched on the material shortages. We had Ben Briggs in our office that talked about immigration. And then uh, Trey Batcher spoke about some licensing issues. Uh, and we had a lot of attendance at our booth. You know, it was, um, I was, I was really surprised at how packed it was. In fact, I would say that Thursday was probably the largest crowd I can remember in recent years. So how was your experience there, John? Yeah, no, I agree with that. Definitely first day, which was Thursday of the show, I would say within the last 10 years, um, you know, you and I both been going there for, 20 plus years, but definitely within the last 20, uh, 10 years, it's the largest first day crowd that I've seen. I mean, it was, I, I couldn't get to come on Wednesday, you know, to some of the other events, but I started there on Thursday and it took me over an hour just to get my bags, but it's kind of good in a way. Got a chance to stand up on the top floor and talk to everybody while they were waiting for their bags. So it was an excellent crowd. Yeah, it was a good turnout. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting, John, seeing how the rest of the year looks. And the reason I say that is, um, you know, we're experiencing a resurgence in COVID-19 here in Florida. Um, you know, the numbers have gone through the roof, not just in infection rates, but also hospitalization. Um, and recently we, we noted, and I think I posted something on LinkedIn that uh, Las Vegas has returned to uh, mandatory mask, um, both indoors and out and uh, in certain situations with transportation. Uh, regardless of whether or not you've had a vaccine. So that's going to affect a lot kind of moving forward. What I anticipate, John, is that a lot of these um, counties and states that had restrictive um, mandates in the past are going to start returning to that, right? I think some of these uh, states that really had things shut down, they will probably be the first ones to do it. I know our governor has basically said we're staying open regardless, but how do you think this is going to impact construction? You know, really that's you know, we're kind of a mess culturally right now, but I'm always concerned about business and what that means for the industry. How do you think it's going to help or hurt us? Well, it's definitely different than when the pandemic hit last year. I I tend to agree. I don't believe we're going to see total shutdowns. You may see some areas try it, but I don't even see the federal government behind total shutdowns. So you got a couple of things going on now. There definitely a lot of people are sick. Um, and again, this is not about whether political environment at all, but when you get this thing, whether you want to think flu, whatever, people are sick, they're missing work. I'm seeing a lot more of that out there. 
So I think production is going to be affected not only in the roofing end, on the roofer side, I think you're going to see it go through manufacturing. You know, we can't even afford to have another 10% of truckers come down with the COVID. So, so all that's there. But interesting enough is that you're starting to see in the news mandated vaccines by corporations and companies, federal government. So I, it should be an interesting, it's not sure how it's going to play out, but I think, uh, I think the workforce is going to change yet once again here in the upcoming months. Yeah, and, uh, you know, this is a good reminder, you know, if, if you uh, didn't shore up your HR policies during last year, you better go back and take a look at them because we're going to be right back to where we were to a certain extent uh, with, you know, people missing time, getting tested, getting vaccinated. You know, how does that interplay with time off? How do, you know, what are your vaccination policies? All that kind of stuff. I know that we have seen a huge uptick in the amount of employment work that we've been doing. And a lot of it's attributable to COVID-19. So um, definitely prepare now because as we start creeping into the fall and winter months, you're going to see those numbers skyrocket. So it's bad now, wait till we get there. You know, that's my concern. Um, you know, the other issue, John, if we're not talking about COVID-19, it's materials, right? I mean, I, I can't look at my email or pick up the phone without hearing something about this problem. I was on the phone with four different contractors today about it. So um, I've talked, we've talked a lot about this, right? I, I've, I've done separate videos on this. I've done articles, I've done posts, I've done blogs, you name it. I can't speak any more about it from a legal standpoint than I've already done. But, you know, some of the issues that have come up recently based on, you know, some things I've seen deal with how manufacturers are dealing with this. And, you know, one of the things that I get a lot, and, and I'm sure you've heard it as well, is we get calls from angry contractors that, that uh, are upset at their manufacturers based on, you know, either price increases or long lead times. And, you know, they ask me generally, you know, what, where, where do I stand? What are my rights? Well, you know, obviously every relationship is different and it depends on a lot of, a lot of different things. But the first thing out, out of my mouth normally is go pull your applicator agreement, pull your credit app to the extent that you got one and look at the terms there because it may, help identify what your rights are and what they're not. Okay, after that, you know, a lot of the correspondence and communications that come out may supplement that or alter what's in those original agreements. So emails, um, you know, official notifications, whatever it might be. But um, the one thing that I wanna hit home to our listeners is just because it feels wrong, uh, in order to prove it is wrong, you need a legal basis and you've got to be able to look at that documentation first to figure out whether that's the case. Now, in the legal world, right, we, we, I always try to play nice in the sandbox, but we occasionally have problems with products or, or manufacturer warranties, those types of things. And we, we go up against them and we have to deal with that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm not saying that that's, that's not something that needs to be done, but I think what I always recommend contractors do is before you um, take that step, make sure you know where you stand from a contractual standpoint. So John, I wanna to turn to you and I know, you know, in your contractor days, um, I'm sure you, you signed and reviewed plenty of applicator agreements. You know, what are your thoughts on the subject and, and you know, how have your, how has your dealings been with manufacturers over the years? Well, you know, price increases as far as quotations go, I, I don't think as a contractor or field we have a whole lot to stand on because almost, I, I even went through some real old things that I found, you know, just kind of seeing where it was 10, 15 years ago, quotes, and every single one of them always has on the bottom, prices are subject to change without notice, but that's a quote we're talking about. Now, uh, as far as the applicator agreements, a lot of times they got similar things in there like that and the credit apps that they have the right to change the game, you know, for, for due to acts of God, that used to be a big one in there. I'm sure these will be changed now to pandemics and everything else. I, honestly, it's an interesting, interesting topic. I, other than like you say, the legal ground for it, uh, it's a tough road to hoe either way. I mean, from a contract, I don't think you're going to find a magic bullet um, by anybody. I think they probably, everybody's been too smart covering their own behinds for many years, but I don't know. We've been in a lot of things over the years. This is a little bit different, though. This is where you can't even get a guarantee once you put a purchase order, part of your order ships. I've heard of contractors that I've been dealing with out there. They tell me they've ordered material, 
say they ordered five truckloads of material due in on X day, three truckloads show up, two didn't, the other two are pushed off by nobody's power except they didn't have the material and the prices are going up. So I, I don't know about that. That's a that's a different world. That I got to say, I've never run into that where you got nailed on a price increase because someone couldn't deliver you an item. I think that's probably the biggest problem right now. Yeah. And look, it's just a tough situation. You know, the, there's plenty of fingers to, to point, you know, and plenty of blame to go around. Um, but my focus has always been keep that end user, keep that customer happy. And if that's the case, the contractor's happy, you know. Um, so it is, it's been a very, very difficult, um, you know, crisis level event and we're not even through it yet. I mean, we got a long ways to go. So obviously we'll, I'm sure we'll be speaking about, you know, other nuances to this issue, uh, in the weeks to come. Um, looking on the horizon, uh, we got IRE coming up August 9th through the 12th. I know, uh, I'll be speaking, uh, both on a panel on the materials issue as well as with Midberg's on immigration. And John, you're speaking as well. What are you speaking on? Yeah, speaking uh, early on Wednesday morning out there on scaling your business for economic conditions. Uh, we got a lot of stuff to go over on that because when we first put in for this presentation, we were hoping to be on the very backside of COVID. And here we are, we're going right back down in the tunnel, material shortages. So going to cover a lot of important things. And then I'm also on the uh, panel with you as well. Yep. Yep. Should be a good time. Looking forward to it. Now, John, you know, it's that magic time, right? I'm not going to let I'll you I'll bet you it's off. time for a question. It is. I'm not going to let you off without a question, John. All right. So uh, this one is from Ben. And uh, Ben has, this is more, I guess I can chime in a little bit. But the question is, is that when you are looking to promote someone internally, you know, do you have a checklist or um, things that you go by in order to determine whether or not that person is qualified? So in the example they give here is how do you determine whether or not a crew person is entitled to a promotion to foreman, foreman to superintendent, et cetera? You know, what was your experience? So I can say from a legal standpoint, you know, from an HR perspective, it's always a good idea to not only have somebody's job function, but also identify you know, what the possibilities are for your promotion, you know, um, writing something down eliminates ambiguity and confusion. So that's always a goal, right? You don't want people to not understand what the game is. You want to give them the opportunity to play it and then it's up to them to play it, right? So that's kind of what I would say from a legal standpoint. John, you know, how about from the contractor side? Yeah, I mean, you're, when you're in a position you have in a, in a contracting company, your job description should really be part of your review process. You should be reviewing on the goals that you expect in each one of these jobs um, performance wise, and you should be doing regular performance reviews. So you have that to consider when you're getting ready to promote somebody up. So if somebody has excelled in, in whatever areas you need for that, then they're probably able to remove. But the biggest problem that I've seen over the years is people get promoted because it may seem like the right person for the job, or you have a need so bad you promote somebody. That usually ends up in not a great position for either the candidate being promoted or the person, you know, the company that's doing the promotion. So clear reviews, clear goals. Also, the new position you're putting them into, most important, train for that position. Because they're now coming, let's say they are a superstar. You're maybe a superstar in this position but you're now going into a position that's all new. So again, training, goals, mentoring, and evaluate. Yeah, clearly, you know, that mentoring part is key. If you're, if you're a company that doesn't have good mentorship, it really shows. And, I, you know, I definitely think that's an important part. Um, John, as always, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I'd like to let everybody know that if you've got any questions for us, please feel free to reach out. You can always reach me at uh, Trent Cotney at tcotney at cotneycl.com. John, how can I get you? Uh, Jay Kenny at CottonECL.com. Great. And uh, stay tuned for more. We've got a lot of really cool, exciting announcements coming. So we will see you next week for another lawnmower. Take care, everyone.